Next, I have the privilege, we have a guest speaker with us this morning, and I've, he's, I've been uh, with him for the past couple of days, and I just tell you, you are, uh, you are in for a blessing this morning, because uh, Robert is, he just carries so much of God. Uh, we were having him last night for a, men's, a time of men's ministry here, and just, uh, it just, you know, just, just being with him and just hearing his heart for men, and not just for, for men, but, but the identity that God, with the message of identity that, he's, that God's given him to carry to men, that would see them awakened to who they are as sons of God. It was just such a, a, a special message last night, and I look forward to learning more about his ministry uh, but this morning he's with us, and I'll just give him a, an official uh, welcome here. He is a speaker, a minister, and an author. He's the founder of Men on the Front Lines Ministries and Robert Hodgkin's Ministries. He uh, also serves as one of the core leaders of Patricia King Ministries. He hosts a weekly Heroes Arise broadcast. He co-hosts the show Propel with Patricia King and is a regular guest and co-host of Supernatural Life on God TV. So some of you may be very familiar with him or watch his shows. He fervently believes that every Christian is a miracle-working explosion of the kingdom waiting to happen. Amen? Are you explosion waiting to happen? Well, anyway, Robert, come on up. You guys welcome with me Robert Hodgkin. Thank you, thank, you, thank, you, thank, you, thank, you. thank you all so much. And hey, just before you sit down, sorry, I know you started. I very much appreciate that warm welcome, but I want to give one more round of applause to the one who really deserves it, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Woo! Woo! Thank you all very much. You can be seated. Um, I said this in the 9 a.m., and maybe it's simply because of the wonderful and rich presence of the Lord here in your house, but um, I don't ever want to take for granted that his promises that where two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be there in our midst. I mean, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the creator of the universe, he's right here with us this morning. He's right there with you this morning. That can be something we know and are so familiar with, we forget the awe and wonder of that. God himself is right here with us. And Lord, we honor you and we thank you for that. Holy Spirit, we're so, so grateful that you're here. We thank you that we don't even have to invite you. You're here. We simply ask that you would move in our midst, tangibly, powerfully, that you would meet every person exactly where they are. And Lord, you know I don't mean in the seat they're seated in, but everything they're dealing with, everything they're thinking, everything they're feeling, everything they're overcoming, everything they're challenged by, God, I ask that you would meet them exactly where they are. And throughout this service, Holy Spirit, I ask not only that you would put your words in my mouth and help me minister to every believing believer and precious saint that is in this place because they are part of your plan for this hour. I ask you to encourage them. I ask you to empower them. I ask you to equip them. And I ask you to make it really, 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 really personal. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you for letting me be here with you this morning. I want to I wanna give some stuff away quickly. My first ministry in our ministry was the resource table. I worked the resource table for years. I love resource. I know that like whenever I get to go someplace, I love to pour into people. I love to equip and encourage people. And I'm grateful for the time I get with you today. But I also know that I'm gonna leave soon. And if I have the chance to put something in your hands that's one of our resources, I know it can equip you for days, years, seasons to come. I got saved through a sovereign visitation of the God I'd mocked and made fun of for almost 40 years. I had dismissed Jesus as a myth, a fairy tale, a scam. I was a mocker and persecutor of Christians. I was brutal. I used to say Christianity is just a crutch for weak people that can't make it on their own. And then one day I discovered I was right. <sighs> And the God that I'd made fun of showed up outside my cabin in the woods of Montana and all he wanted me to know was that he refused not to love me. And he poured his love out on me and for the first time in my life, 
despite having achieved many things I was told by the world, by my family, by society, should have made me fulfilled and happy. Ooh, I was a dark soul. And when the Lord declared, I refuse not to love you, I had this conversation with him inside of his I amosity. The present tense of God, his I amness, blows me away, you know? I don't know if the conversation lasted two seconds, two months, two years, two hours, I don't know, because it was simply present tense. And it was heart to heart. No words were spoken, but things were clearly communicated. And I brought every wicked, arrogant, selfish, hateful, hurtful thing I had ever done in my almost 39 years of life before him. And there was a lot. You would not have liked me back then. But every single thing I brought before the Lord, all he said was, I refuse not to love you. There is nothing in us that he will turn away from. And his desire is only that anything we're wrestling with, we would turn to him with it. I had anger issues for years before Christ, but to be perfectly blunt, even in Christ, I've had anger issues. And the Lord told me once, early on in my walk with him, I, I, called, I used to call 2 a.m. the hissy fit hour because I'd be up in the middle of the night, you know, a new Christian, a new believer storming around my little living room, having a little two-year-old in the Lord hissy fit. And I was yelling about something. Who knows what I was upset about back then? I was so easily upset back then. But I was saying something and I was yelling and I was really frustrated. And all of a sudden I realized I was yelling at God. And the fear of the Lord hit me. I fell to my knees. I got on my face. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I'm yelling at you. You've saved me. You've done everything for me. Please forgive me. You know what the Lord said to me? I'm a big God. I can take it. And this is what he spoke to me. He said, I would much rather you turn to me in your anger then turn away from me because of it. And he poured out his love on me. And after a little while, he said, now do you want to know what you're really angry about? I said, I do. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story. But um, in that moment, I realized truly he is the safest, safest place for any of us. You know, he, no one, and this is, I have the da anointing, by the way. I have, I, God makes things simple for me. I was telling the guys last night, I'm a reformed intellectual. I was a postmodern nihilistic deconstructionist. And I'm now just a lover of Jesus. I have the duh anointing. Things are really, really simple. And I like it simple because the kingdom's simple. But it, it, it just, it kind of blew me away that there's absolutely nothing I can't talk to God about. And I tell people all over the world, God's favorite place to meet us is exactly where we are. The challenge is we're not always willing to be there because we feel guilty or we feel ashamed or we feel like I shouldn't think these thoughts or I shouldn't do these things. And the truth is we probably shouldn't, but the only thing that's going to heal us and help us and break it off of us is him. He's not put off by any of it. To this day, almost 20 years into my walk with God, I'm still blown away that those things I hesitate to bring to him, I have the duh anointing. All of a sudden I'll go, oh, duh, he already knows. Like I could hide it from him. My wife jokes with me, my mentor lovingly teases me. I still have this illusion that I'm inscrutable. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, 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 I can hide when I'm, fe I, I am a deep prophetic feeler. I am an emotional communicator and I still sometimes think, well, nobody knows what's going on with me. My wife, my dear mentor, Patricia King, sometimes they'll just look at me and be like, what is going on with you, man? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm hiding it really well. No, no, you're not. And God's the same way. He just wants to know what's going on with us. He's never disappointed in you, so don't be disappointed in yourself. Disappointment actually disappoints you. When you choose disappointment, you're taking yourself out of your appointment. And I don't just mean your appointment with meeting with him, absolutely, but what you're appointed here to do. God is not undone by what you're wrestling with. He wants to undo that and give you the victory. He's so good, he's so kind, he's so loving, and he's really, really smart. Yeah. 
So I want to encourage you, especially in this hour and what we're going to get into in this morning's message, um, I, I, I am so passionate about breaking this lie of the devil that there's things we need to be ashamed of. There's things we need to be aware of so we can bring them to God and be healed, but we never need to be ashamed. And you're talking to somebody who's probably made almost every mistake you can make other than a few. On, I haven't murdered anybody, but I've rocked quite a few. And Jesus says, when we raka, it's unto murder. And that word raka can be translated simply as fool or idiot. So if you've ever been in traffic with me, you know there's been times I've thought, you idiot, you just cut me off for no reason. And immediately I think, ooh, I just rocked them. Sorry, Lord, forgive me. I just committed murder in the spirit. Now I could hang my head in shame or I could repent. And too often as Christians, we think repent means hang your head in shame, you filthy sinner. No, repent means Turn to God, turn away from the sin, turn to God and allow him to literally change how you think about things. That's what repent actually is. So now all of a sudden, I'm not thinking, this fool in front of me is slowing me down and doesn't he know I'm kind of a big deal? What's he doing cutting me off? I have a very high opinion of myself. Why doesn't he? And now I'm thinking, oh, somebody just cut me off. I wonder what they're going through. I wonder why they're in such a hurry. I wonder why they're not giving any concern to me. What are they concerned about? Lord, what's on your heart? How can I pray for them? And I'll tell you, just, just the other week, I was wrestling with something, and my dear friend, Patricia King, sat me down like I was talking about. She said, I can tell something's going on with you. What's going on with you? And I won't go into all the details, but I was like, I'm really wrestling with something. So I can tell. And it had to do with a very, very, very challenging individual. And I like mapped out all the challenges. Anybody have challenging individuals in your life? And all of a sudden, as we're talking through it, I get the revelation, the challenge really isn't how this person is behaving, and it was incorrect. The challenge is how I'm responding to it. That was really the issue. And so we prayed together, and I said, you know, I'm gonna get the victory over this, because I realize I have not looked and sounded like Jesus for the, the, the last day. I'm gonna get the victory. And I was blessed with more time with this person. And I totally got the victory. And what was so good, I actually sent her a text afterwards. I said, you know what's amazing? When we choose to walk in love, it's so much easier. There's this sense with challenging people. I'm very, you won't know it from today. I'm very confusing. You will not know it from today, but I am actually really, really introverted. When I'm preaching, the anointing comes upon me. I'm an enthusiastic communicator. I seem like an extrovert. I'm not. I'm super, super introverted. I love time alone. I love people. I love serving people, but they're always, I love pouring into people. I love praying for people. I'm happy to pray for any of you today. Um, but then there comes a point when the time of service is done and I just need a bunch of time alone to get recharged. And this person was, was like super draining to me. But I realized, wait, I'm shutting down my heart because I find them draining and challenging and some wrong behaviors that I was allowing to set me off. But when I shifted into the place of realizing, wait, no, love himself is inside of me. And he puts up with me all day, every day. And he never shuts his heart off to me. Why am I shutting him? And I chose to walk in love. I, I texted Patricia afterwards. I was like, you know what's crazy? I've known this for 20 years and I still have to relearn it and relearn it and relearn it. When I walk in love, it's so much easier. There's this lie of, oh, that's really challenging. I'm just gonna hyper-establish a boundary and a hard heart because that's easier. No, it takes way more energy. It's way more draining to harden your heart than simply love and accept people where they are. That has nothing to do with today's message. <laughs> that was just so you could get to know me and not make any mistake because I have a microphone in my hand that I am some kind of super Christian or mature Christian or anything other than exactly what you are. A friend of Jesus who he has great things for you to do. We'll never be qualified in ourselves, but the good news is, A, we don't have to be. And if we're not qualified in ourselves, we can't be disqualified by ourselves. So I want to quickly give some stuff away and then we'll move into today's message. I want to share a prophetic perspective of the hour that we're in. But very quickly, let me give away some uh, teachings. This is a favorite of mine. It's called God of the Impossible. Um, and uh, years ago, I was in my prayer chair. I can't remember how many years does it say. In 2015, 
I was in my prayer chair and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want to reintroduce myself to my people as God of the impossible. And I won't go into the whole thing, but he showed me what that title is in the Hebrew. And um, uh, 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 it's actually Lord God Almighty. And there's only like, as I recall, because it was seven years ago, but there's three places in the Bible God introduces himself as the Lord God Almighty. He introduces himself many times as Almighty God, the Lord, all of that. But there were three or four, I can't remember, but only three or four places where he declared to someone, I am the Lord God Almighty, God of the impossible. And in every one of those situations, get this, I was shocked by this. In every one of those situations, it was to somebody he had given a promise to who tried to bring it about in their own timing, in their own strength, and had completely made a mess of it. The great example is Abram and Sarai, and you know, we always talk about, Sarah, maybe she was Sarah then, I never remember the timeline, but Sarah says, hey, you know what, this really isn't working out, maybe let's give God a helping hand, let's get Hagar in here. And people are always like, yeah, Sarah invited her in. I'd like to point out, Abram didn't say no. <laughs> he could have said, honey, I totally get it, I really want an heir too, but um, that's not what he said. So Abram was just as much a part of what happened that we're still dealing with because what was birthed? Ishmael. We're still dealing that in the world today. But when God showed up in, I believe it was Genesis 15, but again, this was years ago, he didn't say, come on, man, what are you doing? You've made a mess of this. All he declares is, I am God of the impossible and my word will come to pass. So I wanna give this to somebody who, and I realize this is vulnerable and you may not wanna admit this and that's totally okay, but you've been believing for something, you've tried to bring it about in your own way and timing and it hasn't quite worked. I am declaring he is God of the impossible. Come on up lady, ma'am, sorry. <laughs> Where did that, come on up lady. Come on up ma'am, thank you. I'm probably older than you are, yeah. Um, this is another teaching of mine. This is one of my core teachings, one of my life revelations, establishing realms of power in the spirit. Um, it's all about how my walk with God, he'll often do something sovereignly to remind me of what I have in him, the power and authority that I have. But then every time he's done that, he has blessed me with a season to walk that out by faith. And what we do when we do that, I explain how the substance of faith works. There's a lot of teaching on faith, but there's not much teaching on the substance of faith, which Hebrews 11 says, our faith is not just a belief, but there's a substance to our faith. And when we choose to believe eternal truth over temporary facts, the substance of our faith works to establish in this realm what we already have in the eternal realm. So this will help you understand you're not contending for something you don't have. You're contending for greater manifestations of what you do have, and there are realms you're called to go after that you're passionate about, come on up, and you haven't seen it yet, but it's not because you not have it, it's because you're establishing a realm of so much authority and power that at a word, things will shift. This book is very precious to my wife, Yuri and I. It actually came from when we were engaged and we were inspired to seek God for promised scriptures over our marriage. I serve in a prophetic ministry. I serve in a ministry that loves the word of God. So when you're prophetic and you love the word of God, you love decrees, amen? And we realized that we could decree, we could get promised scriptures from God and decree them over our marriage before we stepped into it. We could frame our marriage in the spirit before we ever stepped into it in the natural. And God gave us decree after decree after decree until just about every single area that I can certainly think of and even more that he could think of that have to do with a man and woman coming together and establishing a family. There's decrees for every single area and it became our book, Divine Union. Um, uh, decrees for a heavenly marriage. And I wanna tell you this book works. There you go. It works because I got married later in life. I didn't get married for the first time until I was 50. My wife before Jesus had been married before. I was her, I was her trophy husband. 
She's younger, smarter, and way better looking than I am, but I refer to myself as her trophy husband. And uh, she was in her early 40s. I was 50 years old. And everybody told us when you get married later in life, it's really challenging because you're so set in your ways. I want to tell you, we made those decrees. Our intercessors made those decrees. Our first year was bathed in butter. We didn't even have a disagreement till our second year, but here's the other reason I know that book works. When we did, it was a doozy. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck? And Lord was like, no, no, no. I gave you those decrees for a reason. Use them. I'd love to tell you that Uri and I have a perfect marriage, but I'd be lying and Christians aren't supposed to lie. We have a good marriage. One of the reasons we have a good marriage is was we continue to frame it and rebuild the foundation of it through those decrees. The word of God works. There's never been a time we've been in a disagreement where when I've gotten those out and prayed through them, that the atmosphere hasn't shifted and what was a disagreement became a way for us to understand each other better and actually grow closer. So whether you're on your way to being married, whether you're married now and you want to see your marriage continue to approve, or if your marriage is really going through a hard time. One quick testimony. Yuri, who is very busy in her calling, and I'm very busy in mine, and we love each other and support each other in our individual callings, she can't get to a lot of events with me because of how busy she is. But she was actually at one of our really big events, and it was rare that we were together. And this lady came running up to us and said, oh, I can't believe you two are here together. I have to tell you a story about divine union. I'm like, great. And she said, yeah, I bought the book, and within a couple weeks, I was getting ready to leave my husband. I was like, not a great testimony. <laughs> she said, no, 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 no. But the Lord reminded me to use the book, and he asked me. She said, my husband and I were done. We were beyond done. We were years of done, done, done. And the Lord asked me, will you commit to making these decrees one a day every day for the next nine months? And she said, I didn't want to, but I knew it was him, so I did it. And she said, you know, within nine months, I had a brand new marriage. It was completely transformed. God was, I'm not saying that it happened overnight, but I'm thrilled that it happened because nine months is a gestation period. And by sending forth the word of God, it rebirthed and renewed her marriage to where she said it's better than when we were first married. The word of God works. And then finally, this is for the guys, um, our 31 decrees for, of, 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 of blessing for men. It's a daily devotional every day. A scripture and a devotion reveals something you've been blessed with as a man of God, a son of God. Then there's 10 decrees to frame that in your life and simple activations to step out into it and activate it. Would you give it to that man back there? Thank you so much, Grant. Um, and one of my favorite testimonies about this, because we've seen it be so helpful with men, I don't think you're supposed to say this, but I read that devotional. I know I wrote it, but I read it because um, it's really good. And I have to remind myself sometimes of things I've been blessed with. But my wife, one of my wife's patients came to her one day and was talking about her brother, how her brother had fallen away from God, how it was really challenging because he was so anointed and so called for this. And Yuri said, well, let me give you a copy of my husband's book, 31 Decrees of Blessing for Men. And her, her patient looked at her and said, I'm not a man. She said, no, I get that. I'm your doctor. I'm very aware. Um, but she said, you can make these decrees over your brother. Within, I think it was one month, it might have been two, but I know it was within a couple months. Um, her, this patient who's also become a friend of hers, they were out to lunch, and she said, my brother's a different man. So for husbands, I mean, for wives, for your husbands, for mothers or fathers, for your sons, I know you've got a perfect pastor in this house, so you don't need to make them over Darren, but... <laughs> But the, you can make these decrees over other people as well. They're very, very powerful, and they work. All right. Um, is it all right if I do a little prophetic ministry at the top? Okay. Is the young woman who did the announcements here, she did the video announcements, is she here? Okay. You going to go grab her? Okay. What's her name? Faith. Oh, Faith. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, Pastor um, uh, Patty, would you come up here? Would you mind coming up here? I want to I wanna pray something over you and release something that I saw in the Spirit. So now I want to make sure you all know I believe in integrity and in the prophetic. So Pastor Patty and I were talking before the service, and I learned something about her. I learned that she used to work for the RCMP. But as soon as you said that, something began stirring in me, and during worship I was asking the Lord about it. Now, in the United States of America, law enforcement is part of the executive branch of government. I don't know how it works in Canada. All I know is I'm praying for Mr. Trudeau. Um, um, I, but here... 
It's part of the executive branch. And as soon as I pressed in for why God was highlighting that you worked for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Lord showed me that a whole new level of authority to execute the word of God in the earth is coming upon you. Can I put my hand on your head? And the Lord said that Isaiah 55.5 is a promised scripture to you. And you will speak to nations and they will obey because the Lord is anointing you with increased executive authority to execute and to legislate his will and his ways in the earth and you will speak to cities you will speak to counties you will speak to nations and they will obey because the Lord has made you glorious and there's a glory cloud of heaven that is being assigned to you and when God puts a city a nation a region or a people group upon your heart that his presence will descend like a glory cloud like in the tent of Moses and from that place of authority that you will often feel but even when you don't you will know that it is there, you will execute and legislate his word, his will, and his ways over those people, those cities, those counties, those nations, and they will obey because the Lord has made you glorious. Lord, I thank you that you are releasing her into an assignment of releasing angels into the earth to perform your word when it's declared. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I so love this church and what you guys are doing. We partnered with you uh, uh, in going to the Ukraine. Come on up. We sowed uh, some support into that. I'm so, so grateful that you went. I love that this church goes. I love that you went into, I, I may not remember the names, but Chaz and Chop, come on up. And that you, you saw all of that as an opportunity for, to arise and shine. I love that. I love churches that go. We're a church that goes. I've been into, I think it's 39 nations around the world now, doing everything from coming against and seeing uh, human trafficking torn down, atmospheres over nations shifting. But what I want to say is while I'm so thrilled that you were a church that goes, I'm also glad that you were a church that intercedes and prays. Because what God just released over Pastor Patty is available to all of you. We need to be speaking to our nations from the heart of the Father, with the passion of the creator, not to condemn them, but so they come back into alignment. Where there's love, where there's honor, there is power. And we have to step into the love and honor God has for our cities, our regions, and our nations and stop condemning them and stop cursing them and stop murmuring and complaining and start speaking to them because we can shift atmospheres. Your name's Faith? Faith, on um, both services, when I got to see you doing the announcements, what the Lord stirred in me was, and this will probably be a confirmation, you probably already know it, you're called to media. There is a media anointing that is going to be increasing upon you, not only for announcements, but what the Lord told me is your church needs to hear your voice, and it's great that you're doing these announcements each week, but the Lord said your generation needs to hear your voice. And he said he is anointing you, appointing you, and anointing you to be a voice in your generation, and do not despise the days of small beginnings. And whatever it is, I don't know all of them, but whether it's, I don't do TikTok, um, I it confuses me. I'm old. Um, but whatever it is, whether it's Facebook Live or it's Instagram Reels or whatever it is, can I put my hands on you? I'm going to release to you the media anointing that our church and our ministry walks in. And I want to share a little bit of my story. When I was called to media, I didn't want it because that made me very nervous because I was very self-conscious early on in my walk. And I'd always notice what I did wrong as opposed to what the Lord spoke right. And I was very hard on myself. And I used to pray in tongues for 30 minutes to an hour before doing a three to five minute video clip because I was so nervous. And then one day the Lord just broke that off of me and said, I called you be you. And now if you watch any of the shows or streams or broadcasts that I'm involved in, almost every one, you'll catch me misspeaking or stumbling over my words, but it doesn't matter because it's all about God speaking through us. And I want to break, media is very challenging because media is very selfish. It makes us self-aware. We get into competition. We get into jealousy, but in the kingdom, none of that matters. Like when I started in media, my mentor, Patricia King, um, 
I would do shows with her on God TV, um, and that's where I learned media. But then when I do my own streams and own shows, for the first year, I'm not proud of this, but I believe in being honest, I would check and be like, well, Patricia's thing got 2,500 views. Mine got 300. What's the point? And the Lord spoke to me and said, because there's 300 people that needed to hear from you. And when I stopped comparing and I just started saying, Lord, thank you that you're giving me a word. Thank, especially when, when COVID hit and the lockdowns hit, uh, Arizona, praise God, wasn't, it wasn't as much overreach and shut down as there was in other uh, states, but there, was a, there wasn't a fair amount. But because of our media ministry in our studio and in my home and Patricia's home, we actually reached more people the first year of lockdown than we did in our itinerant and traveling ministry. And I stopped comparing how many am I reaching, how many is she reaching. I was just saying, God, thank you that the word's going forth. So I thank you, Lord, that you've called faith to the media. And Lord, I ask right now that all that you've blessed us with, all that you've established in us, you say freely give what you have freely received. And I declare the realm of kingdom media to be Jesus-minded, to see media is simply a way to serve kingdom purposes and people. God, I ask for a great grace of increase, increase, increase to come upon faith right now, to be able to so connect with your heart that she'll begin to feel the people on the other side of the camera, whether it's live or pre-recorded, that you'll do for her what you've done for us. And Lord, I release that media anointing from the heart of the Father, filled with the power of the Spirit, all to the glory of Jesus Christ. Christ. And I say, declare the word of the Lord. Preach the gospel. Speak to your generation in word and power. And Lord, I thank you that you're going to make her an overt and covert kingdom media agent, that there'll be times she'll be declaring scriptures and doing teachings. But many times you're gonna give her a message for her generation where your name is not mentioned, but you're, she, you, you, you have filled her heart so overflowing with you that it will be a covert way to reach her generation. Lord, I ask that you surround her with a favor as a shield and that many, 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 many will be drawn to your love and your truth as it flows from her mouth out of her eyes and heart to the nations around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. All right, so what I want to do this morning is I want to talk a little bit about the season that we're in. And, and um, one of the things God has blessed me with is he often helps me discern the times and be aware of the times. It's the son of Issachar anointing. It's one of the prophetic mandates we have in our ministry. And oftentimes God will help me understand what's going on in a season, but even more, what I get excited about and what I seek him for is what's the strategy. And God gave me several words coming into 2022, and I, I only have time to kind of lean into this one this morning, um, um, but it's an important one, and that's why I want to do it. One of the, God had given me several words for 2022 that were about the season that we were in, but I was saying, God, what's the strategy? What's the strategy? What's the strategy? And one morning on our couch down in our living room, the Lord spoke clearly to me when I said, what's the strategy? And it wasn't an audible voice, but it was inner and clear. And he said, get over yourself. Now, to me, and my age and my generation, we had an expression, get over yourself, which was very dismissive. Like, stop thinking so highly of yourself. And that was my first response is, did God just tell me, get over yourself? And as I leaned into it, I realized, no, that's not what he was saying at all. Because it was loving, it was encouraging, it was not dismissive, it was an invitation. And I realized what he was saying, it echoed in my heart, it was get over yourself. Get above yourself. Rise above yourself. And as you do, that's your strategy. The more you're willing to rise above yourself, the more you will see the fullness of my presence, power, and personality released to everyone everywhere you go. Right now, he was showing me so many, even in the church and in the kingdom, were mired in ourself. And we'll unpack that in just a little bit. But he said the strategy is to get over yourself, to rise above. It's what John the Baptist was saying when he said, I must decrease so he can increase. He wasn't saying, man, I really kind of stink. 
I'm the problem. No, he was saying, I realize that self is my old carnal nature that I'm supposed to be dead to, and it keeps trying to rise up. You know, in the Old Testament, it says how um, communing with the dead is a sin. The New Testament version of that is, hey, we're to raise the dead. So going and spending time with the dead obviously is not a sin because we're just supposed to go and raise the dead. What I believe the New Testament version of necromancy or, or communion with the dead would be is us allowing our old dead self that's dead in Christ to rise up and rule and reign, to lead. And we've got to get over that self. We've got to rise above it because we're in a season right now when many prophetic voices, myself included, for years have been declaring we've entered an Isaiah 60 season. I've probably been seeing that for a good five years, if not a little bit more, but wow, is it clear now. So I wanna unpack this word a little bit, give you some insight, give you some revelation, give you some strategy, and I wanna do it by starting with Isaiah 60, verses one through three. I know you all know it very well, but remember, I have the dot anointing. So don't tune out because this is simple. The kingdom is simple. It's not always easy, but it's simple. And, and one of the things I love, let's, let's jump in here, is that right now, everything that's going on in the world can be a little overwhelming. And we can feel powerless because there are politicians, there's media, there's school board officials that seem to be making all the decisions and they just seem to be making one wicked decision after another. That good is being called evil, evil's being called good. And we can sit there and just go, it's just too much, I'm overwhelmed. And the lie of the enemy is that we're small and powerless. What I want you to see by the time we're done today is you are anything but small or powerless. And even if, you're in lockdown in your house, you can reach the whole what excuse me, the whole wide world by agreeing with eternal truth and declaring it into the atmosphere. You can shift nations by doing that. So the other thing I want you to know, and you already know this, so I'm only going to reconfirm this. We may at times be overwhelmed and undone by all that's going on, but I want you to know God's not. There have been times, I'm 57 years old, and there have been times I've thought, Man, I never thought it would be this dark. This is intense. God has never once said, you know, Archangel Michael, I never thought it would get this dark. This is intense. What, 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 do, you, what, do, you, what do you think we should do? God's never undone, overwhelmed, or confused about what's going on. He has a plan, and you're going to see you're part of it. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth was laid. This was actually a couple years ago, right when all the pandemic government overreach stuff was beginning to happen. I was getting a little overwhelmed by it. And I thought, God, the world is getting so dark. There's so much darkness. There's so much wickedness. There's so much unrighteousness and so much sin. And you know what he said to me? It's not more than when I came and dealt with it the first time. And all of a sudden, I had this revelation. Wait a minute. When this realm was literally given over to Satan, Satan had the keys to this realm that we gave to him at the fall in the garden. Satan ruled and reigned here. God's answer was, well, I'll go and deal with it. As dark as it is, I want you to know, it's not darker than it was when Jesus came. And Jesus wants to come again. I'm not talking eschatology. I am talking Jesus wants to come through you. Because you were his plan for the hour. You were his solution bringer. You were his difference maker. He is not afraid. He is not undone. He is not overwhelmed. He's okay if you are. He just wants to meet you there and love on you and remind you, not by might, not by power, but by his Holy Spirit in you, with you, and for you. Because when you said yes to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you not only received the gift of eternal life and you're not going to hell, praise you Jesus but you also were restored to the plan since day six we forget this sometimes God's plan since day six is to have a people in the earth willing to be in relationship with him who will walk with him and talk with him and be mentored by him and discipled by him and taught how to bring the kingdom to the earth through them 
I've taught on this and once someone said to me, I don't believe any of that. You're saying God's not sovereign. I'm saying no, anything but. God's absolutely sovereign. But what you're missing is a sovereign plan since day six is to have you and to work through you. If that wasn't the case, we'd say yes to Jesus and go home to heaven. It's better. It's better. But there's a plan that we've been restored to and we're fulfilled in it. That's why Jesus said to the original disciples, come follow me. Notice he didn't say, come believe in me. He saw that they believed, so they, he invited them to walk with him, just like Adam and Eve walked with the Father in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was the overlap between heaven and earth, where God would mentor, disciple, call it rabbi, his people. So they'd be more effective in, in, in representing him as his dominion stewards, kingdom come conduits, and representatives in the earth, according to Genesis 1, 26 through 28. There was Eden that we operated from, but the Garden of Eden was the overlap between heaven and earth where we met with him and were taught by him and walked with him. When Jesus came, he was the perfect representation of the Father, the visible representation of the invisible Father. Jesus was the overlap between heaven and earth. And he said, hey, walk with me. I see that you believe, so I'm inviting you as a believer to be a disciple. Let me mentor you, disciple you, and rabbi you in how to bring the kingdom to the earth. Because the works that I do, you're gonna do, because there's a day coming soon and you're not going to get this and it's going to make the needle skip off the record to the last minute, but you're going to be my body in the earth. And now, where's the overlap between heaven and earth? Put your hand on your belly and say me. You are the overlap between heaven and earth. The kingdom of God dwells within you. Jesus declares it in Matthew 16 that when we get that he's Messiah, we become the gate of heaven into the earth. And we have the gift of the Holy Spirit so we can turn our thoughts to him at any moment, at any time about anything and walk with him and be mentored, discipled, and rabbied in how to be more effective for the kingdom in the earth. Isaiah 60 makes it clear. Let's look at this. I'm reading out of my 19, oh no, I think this is the NASB. I use a bunch of different translations. I think this is the NASB that I wrote out here. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Let's stop there for a moment. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So God's declaring right at the top, I've got a solution and you're a big part of it. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. Let's, let's pause there for a moment. A couple important things here. First of all, God says, behold, Darkness is on the earth and deep darkness are on the people. He's saying, I want you to see it. Don't turn away from it. Don't be overwhelmed by it. I want you to see it so that you can, I can work with you to deal with it. Because if you deny it, ignore it, or hide from it, I can't use you to deal with it. Many prophets, as you know, in 2020 got words about how 2020 was gonna be a year of clear vision, right? And I, I got, God gave me different words for 2020, but I honor and respect those words. It was probably around August or September of 2020, the Lord spoke to me to bring a message to our church about how 2020 was the year of clear vision. And while many people thought that meant we were gonna see God more clearly, miracle signs and wonders more clearly, which by the way, we did, God's specific instruction to me was, let my people know that the clear vision I have for them in 2020 is so they can clearly see the enemy, so they know what the enemy's up to, and they will be like my special force snipers that when they see the enemy clearly, I will tell them how to take the enemy out. But if you do not see the enemy, you cannot take him out. And he said, too many are giving in to feeling overwhelmed. Let them know I love them. Let them know I'm there for them. But let them know I also want to encourage and remind them that they're part of my solution and not to turn away from the wickedness in the earth, but to let me help them see the powers and principalities behind it clearly so I can use them to take him out. And that's what God is saying here. Behold. There's darkness on the earth and deep darkness on, on the people. 
You might be able to sow, there's deep darkness on my prodigal. There's deep darkness on my finances. We dealt with a situation last year in my family where there was deep, deep, wicked darkness upon my wife when all of a sudden she was diagnosed with a very large, very aggressive tumor in form of cancer out of the blue. And it undid us for a little bit. But then I had to remember, wait, God says, behold the darkness, not because it's your portion, not because it's going to win, but I need you to see it so you can partner with me to take it out. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. Other important thing I want you to see here, catch the kingdomness of this, the I amosity of this, the present tenseness of the now God of this. He's saying, here's the solution. I want you to be aware of it before I present the problem. Arise and shine. You do it, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. So that's the solution. Now that you know the solution, let's talk about the problem because you're gonna deal with it. I love that he presents the solution before the problem. So even before we behold the darkness, we have hope that he's dealt with it. Our light has come and he is going to deal with it through us. That's the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. You know, what is, uh, I don't have this in my notes, but what is it in Matthew 6, I think it is, where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Sometimes we read that and we think, okay, I better be a good Christian. I better seek the kingdom of God first so, God, so my father gives me the cookie. Because if I'm good and I seek the kingdom, then I'll get the cracker. I'll get the cookie, I'll get the reward. He says, seek first the kingdom and these things will be added. So I need to be a good Christian and then these things will be added. That's not what that means at all. He's saying, remember to look at the kingdom first because it's only present tense. I'm not the I was, I'm not the I will be, I am. And every blessing, every promise, every answer is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. You have it, remember it, and then these things will be added to you in this realm, but it begins by knowing you have it in that realm. And as you choose to believe that through the gift, power, and responsibility of your free will, then by choosing to believe the substance, the Hebrews 11 one substance of your faith establishes in this realm what we know is already ours in that realm. But the devil will lie to us and say, it's a really big tumor in your wife's. I'm trying to think of a delicate way to say body. That's a good way to put it. Thank you. It's a very big tumor. And you've seen the imaging of it. It's big, it's nasty, it's ugly, it's gross. It looked like it came from exactly where it came from hell. It looked, when, well, I remember looking at that imaging and it was like, it didn't, but it looked like it had teeth and a mouth and was mocking me, like Goliath mocking the army of Israel. How about those prayers now, big boy? Didn't see me coming, did you? I'm a really big tumor. I'm gonna destroy everything in your life that matters most to you. That's what it sounded like, that's what it felt like. But I had to remember, no wait, seek first the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, she's healed by his stripes. In the kingdom, it's done. And as I choose to believe that and put it right in the face of that ugly little tumor from hell, it must bow. And that life, that health, that strength that she already has been given in Christ, I am blessed to be her husband, her helpmate, and her partner, and her ally to set my eyes on the truth of the kingdom of God and choose to agree with it, choose to believe it, choose to declare it day after day after day when it looks like that thing is getting bigger and worse and she's literally writhing and screaming in agony from the pain and my wife is way stronger than I am, way stronger than I am. And I had to think, Lord, help, help me seek first the kingdom. I'm not earning, I'm not winning anything from you. You've done it, you love her more than I love her. You've done it, help me see that. Help me arise and shine for her healing has come. 
And then the glory of the Lord will appear upon me. And things in the natural will come into alignment with what we already have in the spirit. The solution was there before I ever saw the darkness of the tumor. The solution for our nation was there before we ever saw the wicked, overreach, tyranny, and legislation of those in league with darkness. And we have to remember that they're not the problem. Satan is the problem. And we war not against flesh and blood. But we deal with the powers and principalities that that flesh and blood has been in league with. And we believe for them to be radically set free too. So arise and shine, for your light has come. Let me tell you one of the enemy's favorite strategies the enemy loves to point to current circumstances to get us to be afraid that that's our portion instead of eternal truth. I tell you one of the most profound scriptures in the Bible is Romans 1.25, where it says, for they exchange the truth of God for a lie. I cannot tell you how many times I thought about that tumor, that I thought, Lord, don't let me exchange the truth that she is healed by your stripes, that it's done, that it's finished, that Holy Spirit, you who raised Jesus from the dead are so easily and so well able to raise my wife up and out of this thing. Thank you that you are quickening her mortal body. Whether I see it or not, you're doing it because the word says so. Let me focus on that so that I might choose to arise because if I choose to arise, I will shine. Notice arise comes before shine. And notice arise is a verb and it's a choice and it's an invitation. And it's, it's, it's um, I am not the scientist in my family, my wife is, but in physics, there's this law and to all you scientists out there, if I get it wrong, I apologize, but there's a law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And you're thinking, why is he talking about physics? I wanna hear about God. Well, who do you think created physics? He can supersede it anytime he wants. He's not bound by it, but the physical realm he created, he put those laws in place. So we're seeing a great kingdom example of this. Arise, if you choose to arise. If you choose to arise, the report of your current circumstances. If you choose to arise above those facts. If you choose to arise above the report of the world. If you choose to arise above the report of that medical imaging that shows how big and nasty and aggressive this thing. It's if you choose to arise, you will shine. It's a kingdom principle. Arise, shine. If you choose to arise, you will shine. Because your light has come, if you choose to get over yourself, if you choose to cry out to God for a greater grace to get over yourself, get over your fear, get over your anger, get over your frustration, get over your awareness of the wickedness going on in the earth right now, and you say, God, I see it. Thank you for letting me behold it, but thank you even more that your light has come, and by your grace, I will arise above all my selfish reactions, and when I do that, it's automatic. I don't have to try to shine, I do. Arise, shine, for your light has come. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. Oh, and I love this next word. It's one of my favorite words in the Bible. But, say but. But, darkness on the earth, deep darkness on the people, but the Lord. I can't tell you how many times over the last 13 months I leaned into, but the Lord. Surgeries that were supposed to help and made things worse. And I would cry and I would give place to fear for a minute. And, and, and I, would, I, would, I would go out and get on my knees in the hospital. There was this one bench in the hallway that was my prayer place. And I didn't care who walked around. I never was loud. I was never obnoxious. But it's where I got on my knees. I put my face on that bench. I didn't care who saw me. I didn't care what they think. All I thought was, Lord, I'm blocking out everything but your truth. And I am declaring, but the Lord. When the doctor said, we don't know why this is going on, I got out to my prayer bench and I said, but the Lord. God, you know what's going on. You know how to deal with this. You are the answer. You've already done it. I will arise above my fear. I will arise above my frustration. And when I do, I will shine. Look, I get it. I've got prodigals. I've got some nephews that are working on some testimonies, man. <sighs> We have 
different groups of nieces and nephews. And I'll tell you what, I pray more fervently for the little ones, not out of fear, but out of faith than I ever had before because I want to cover them in so much faith and word and decree that the devil will never be able to lure them. And if he does, I'll be there for him, loving him and reminding him the truth exactly where they are. But I've got some nephews that are working on some pretty big testimonies and I get what it's like to pray for somebody over and over and over again and it looks like they're getting further away from God. But the Lord. You know the answer? Arise above the fear. Arise above the frustration. Arise above the irritation. Because when you do, you start to shine. You can't help it. You may not see it. You may not feel it. You may not wiggle and shake. You might. But you are, when you choose to arise, you will shine. When we choose to get over ourself, we will shine. But the Lord will arise upon you. And his glory will appear upon you you. Nations will come to your light. Kings to the brightness of your rising. Now, is this God saying, hey, I'm off the clock. It's up to you. No, it's God saying, I am sovereign. I am there. I care. I've dealt with it. And I'm going to anoint you and appoint you and grace you to arise and shine and deal with these things in the earth that I am highlighting to you. He doesn't say, but the Lord will rise and shift things. He doesn't say his glory will automatically and sovereignly manifest. It might. He can do that. But his promise is we can partner with him to be graced, to arise. We will shine and his glory will appear upon us. His presence and power will fill us and overflow us. Nations will come to our light. And kings, that means people of influence, men and women of influence, men and women who have been wicked in the earth, all of a sudden get a revelation. Think of King Abimelech in, in Genesis 26. I want to be mindful of the time because I get passionate. In, in Genesis 26, Isaac is dealing with the fact that all the wells of his fathers have been filled in by the enemy. You know what that's a prophetic picture of? Everything we've been given from our Father in heaven. What was the well filled in with? Earth. What are we? Earth. Earthen vessels. When we refuse to rise above our old carnal nature, we actually fill in the wells of revival, reformation, and blessing that we are to overflow with. Now here's the good news. The blood works. As soon as you see that, like me, all you have to do is repent. And as we talked about, repent not only means to turn away from that wrong thing, but it's allow God to help you change the way you think about things. And now all of a sudden, I see an opportunity in all this. I'm gonna arise and I'm gonna shine. And it's gonna shift, not by my might, not by my power, but by his glory, by, by, his, by his spirit, all to his glory. So this happens, and Isaac makes these decisions, and then all of a sudden, his servants come to him and say, hey, you know what? You unplugged the wells of your father, but now we're discovering new wells too. Because he's, he chose to arise and shine. And then King Abimelech, who's been against him and a horrible opponent, is now coming to him and saying, we can't help but see that the Lord is upon you. The Lord is with you. We want to be allies now. If you take your least favorite politician and you continue to stand against their wicked policies, but you rise above your fear, frustration, and anger, and you start praying for them because Jesus died on the cross for them, and sometimes it's hard, I get it. But if you keep praying for your prodigal, it'll shift. But you don't pray for your prodigal of, oh God, will they ever come back to you? I've done that, it doesn't work. <laughs> but I look at them and I say, Lord, thank you that you created them for a purpose. Thank you, God, that you are waking that purpose up in their heart. Thank you, God, that they have no more power to get any further away from you than, than, than uh, uh, not Noah, um, Jonah, thank you, than Jonah did. And Lord, if you need to send a whale, send a whale, but you've got the perfect plan. Thank you, Lord, it's done. But I gotta rise above my fear, and more often than not with me and, and my older nephews, it's irritation, like, come on, man. But it's like, wait, that does no good. Arise, and I'll shine. All right, let me, let me bring this to a close somehow. 
All right, here's what I want to do. So you're seeing that you're God's solution, yeah? You're seeing your, his plan for this hour, yeah? And you're seeing that we don't have to strive or worry because the solution's already in place. We just cooperate with it. And we're also seeing that if you choose not to arise, you choose to mire in the muck of self, God will meet you there and love you there and lift you up out of it. I know from personal experience, this is not a mandate to be perfect and do it right. This is an opportunity to walk with God and be the solution in the earth you were created for. So one of the things I wanna do right now, and I'll go through this quickly because I really only have about five minutes. Um, one of my favorite things I've been praying over myself and my family and our church and my ministries and our bigger ministry is from Psalm 91 that the Lord will set us free from the fowler's snare. Now, different translations put it different ways. I think some say he'll set us free from the traps or something like that. The first time I ever read it as a new believer, I don't know what translation it was, but it said from the fowler's snare. And I like that best because what's a fowler? One who traps birds. So what's a fowler's snare do? It traps a bird. And then the bird can't do what? Arise. It's trapped. It's limited. It can't get off the ground. It can't arise. And the enemy wants to do that with us right now. So I want to highlight quickly a few fowler's snare. And if you realize, ooh, I stepped in that one, the only reason God is letting you see that you stepped in it is because today he's going to set you free from it. Amen? Okay. All right, real quickly. So some of the traps of the enemy, fowler's snare that keep us from arising. This is just a few. This is not exhaustive and I don't even really have time for all of these, so I'll be very quick. One of the things we have to be aware of in this season is being empty. And what I mean by that is you know the story of the 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 10 virgins and the five that did the, the, the lamps were empty. I've read that so many times and think foolish five virgins. Why wouldn't you want your lamp to be full? He's so good and his oil's so good. What, we, what the Lord highlighted to me was we don't know how many times they filled their lamps, kept it burning, and their beloved didn't show up. So they were believing and believing and believing and believing and believing and believing, and then according to their timeline of what they thought was right, it didn't happen, and they got discouraged and decided I'm not filling my lamp anymore. Anybody relate? I do. There were some things I've been believing for and believing for and believing for, and the Lord told me, this is how you get empty in the spirit. So be sure, especially in those areas, to come to me and let me fill you up with hope and vision and anointing and faith. We also wanna be careful of not getting empty in the natural, or in other words, I don't know about you, but when I'm tired or I don't feel well and I'm kinda of running on empty, I tend to be less likely to arise. So the Lord will remind me, hey, attitude check. Maybe get a little more sleep. Maybe get a little exercise. Maybe make some tweaks in your diet. So just be aware that being empty physically or spiritually can make it harder to arise. Okay, here's one of the biggest ones. Let me unpack it quickly, but it's really big. I've learned this over and over again. One of the biggest fowler snares is being right. You're probably right about a lot of the things you think about what's going on in your state and in our nation. I've been right about a lot of things, but the Lord has corrected me a few times and said, you're right, but you're not behaving righteously. God told me several years ago, the next move of God will be marked by his personality. The move of God that brings in the billion plus soul harvest will be marked by his personality. We've had moves marked by his presence. We've had moves marked by his power. We have not yet had a move marked by his personality. This move will contain his presence and be mighty in his power, but it will be marked by his personality. And a real quick ex biblical example of this is the woman at the well in John 4. The Samaritan woman who's a harlot in town and is not thought well of, so she goes to get her water in the middle of day when it's hot and nobody else is there. Everybody else goes first thing in the morning because they need it for washing up, they need it for cleaning up, but she goes in the middle of the day because she's sick of seeing the looks and hearing the murmuring voices. So she goes in the middle of the day every day, but one day she shows up and there's a man 
And it's not just a man, it's a Jewish man. And it's not just a Jewish man, it's a Jewish rabbi man. And this Samaritan woman knows that the Jews think that she's a half-breed to begin with, and that the, 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 the rabbis look down on her even more than everybody else because of her sin, and she's probably thinking, oh man, all right, well no, I gotta get water. All right, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna suck it up, grit my teeth, get my water, and get out of there. And we know that they have this conversation, and here's what I want you to focus on. At one point, Jesus asked her about her life, and to flash forward, he says, you are correct. You've had five husbands and the man you're with now, you're not married to. She says something profound. She says, I perceive you are a prophet. The reason that's profound is you just said, you're right. That's absolutely true. And for a Samaritan woman to say that to a male Hebrew rabbi, she just gave him the legal right to stone her to death on the spot. He could have picked up a rock and killed her and been absolutely right. Why would she be so vulnerable? Because Jesus was love. Because she felt safe to be vulnerable. She becomes a great revivalist. Her whole town gets saved. Why? Because of his presence, yes. Because of his power, yes. But his personality opened the door for his presence and power to minister to her and change everything. If we will arise above being right and choose to be righteous, we will shine like never before. I'll do these next two really quickly. You guys okay? All right. Oh, it's only one more. Good. Be aware of our human propensity to react instead of act. And think about this. Let me unpack this just for a sec. When I say react, what the Lord has shown me is when I react, like knee-jerk reaction, how dare you? I'm reacting. I'm not just reacting, I'm reacting. I'm choosing to act from a repeated series of wrong responses based on my flesh. And if I see that, then I can partner with him to stop reacting and start acting from the kingdom identity that I have and the kingdom power within that. We always say from the revelation of identity becomes a realization of opportunity. And if you catch yourself reacting, if you see that face of that politician and you immediately go into the hard-hearted place, I get it. But we need to understand that what we need right now is resurrection power for revival and reformation in our nation, yes? What's the key to us stepping into the place of resurrection power? The stone has to be rolled away, right? We're gonna celebrate this next week at Easter. So catch this. Heaven did not roll the stone away from the tomb so Jesus could get out, it was so we could get in. And if we want to get into the place of resurrection power that shifts and changes everything to see a revival of righteousness in a nation where, where righteousness seems dead, we've got to allow heaven to roll the stone away from our heart. Because if our hearts are stony, we'll react from a series of frustrations and wrong behaviors as opposed to acting from who we truly are in God and choosing to arise and shine. Amen? Stand to your feet. Let me pray for you. Thank you so much for your patience with me this morning. Such a great atmosphere in this house. It's hard to stop. Lord, I thank you so much that you have before you a family of believing believers. You have before you a mighty company of men and women who are your difference makers and solution bringers. You have before you a company that says yes to an even greater grace to arise above the reports of the day, above the responses of the flesh, to arise above fear and frustration, to arise up and out of the fowler's snare of oppression, discouragement. Lord, I ask that you would come right now and you would move upon them and helping them shake off the yuck of the last few years. And I even encourage you, just shake it all off. And I see angels coming into the room right now with like Holy Spirit whisks. And some of you are gonna feel brushing on your, your, your shoulders, your legs. Some of you are gonna feel on the tops of your head, but heaven is helping you shake it all off right now. And Lord, in addition to shaking off the yuck of the past few years, God, I thank you that you release the great grace to help them arise so that they shine like never before. 
Thank you, Lord, that they have been appointed and anointed. Thank you, Lord, that they are your plan for this hour. And thank you for the increase of your presence, power, and personality in them, on them, and through them. And as they go forth from this place, Lord, let them explode into new levels of authority, power, the miraculous, and most of all, love. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.